Good morning. I'm delighted to be able to talk with you today about some work that we're doing in integrating usability into programming language design. Um, this is joint work with Michael Koblenz, uh, Joshua Sunshine, and Brad Myers, a lot of which appears in Michael Koblenz's thesis. So if you want to be a leader in this area, uh, hire him when he comes on the job market this spring. This is an exciting time for programming languages. Functional programming is everywhere. We're seeing new languages. We're seeing lambdas and other constructs being added to existing languages like Java, C++, and C Sharp. Uh, we're seeing new languages like Rust with powerful type systems that allow us to do safe low-level memory management and many other interesting things. Uh, we're seeing verification of complex systems code um, enabled by recent advances in separation logic, proof of systems, and other tools. Um, but a question I'd like to bring to you today is, can people actually use these new programming languages and tools? Uh, Rust, we see, has an infamous learning curve. Uh, many people, unfortunately, give up learning it. Uh, that hampers adoption. Uh, some succeed, but, uh, but wouldn't it be better if we could get everyone over that curve? Right. Uh, proofs of programs are valuable, but still very expensive. Uh, if you look at some of the Cell, cell 4 or CompCert literature, uh, perhaps the uh, approved correct operating system or compiler costs 10 times what it might cost to develop otherwise. We'd like to make programming more accessible in general. Do advanced programming languages actually harm that goal? In general, what we need is ways to make new programming languages usable so that they can have more of an impact in practice. Now, questions some, some of you may have about this include, you know, is this hard, right? Uh, do I need fancy HCI techniques to do this, or can I kind of wing it? Um, you know, does usability produce deep insights, or is it just about nicer keywords? Uh, does it actually make a difference if we get it right, or is it kind of in the weeds? Well, in this talk, I hope to convince you that uh, designing a usable advanced programming languages is, first of all, important. Um, with good usability techniques, you can get effects that are big enough really to influence adoption of cool new programming language ideas and hopefully make things easier even for uh, people who would have adopted it anyway. Um, but it's hard to do so. Uh, researchers get this wrong all the time, despite obviously not wanting to make their tools more difficult than necessary. Um, and, and getting it right is interesting. It's not just about keywords, but it's about abstractions and mental models and the way that they come together. Um, and you know, if your model of interesting is you know, something that affects my formalization, well, uh, that does include uh, the kinds of things we'll be talking about today. Um, we'll see that some HCI techniques, uh, maybe originally developed for things like user interfaces, can be adapted to design more complicated things like programming languages. We've seen exciting results from doing that. So I hope uh, maybe this talk will be a small part of convincing you to pay attention to uh, programming language usability research and maybe even explore doing some yourself. First example I'll talk about is Glacier. Uh, it's a system for enforcing immutability with types. Uh, Glacier stands for great languages allow class immutability enforced readily. So um, let's first talk about the challenges of immutability types. Is this actually hard? Uh, because a lot of people have worked on immutability for a long time. Immutability is a core concept in functional programming languages. Uh, but when, you, when we try to enforce it, especially at larger scales, you know, whole data structures, not just individual fields or data types, then um, we find out that uh, it's challenging. Uh, we look at some existing systems for doing this, uh, especially in object-oriented languages. Uh, but I think some of the same principles would apply elsewhere. And we find many systems that are very expressive, uh, but also complex. Um, perhaps one of the challenges of, uh, of research systems, right? So we looked at immutable generic Java, for example. Uh, it has a rich set of features, read-only references per object, reasoning about immutability, uh, polymorphism. So you can have you know, immutable collections of mutable objects and mutable collections of immutable objects and so on. Um, so we did a study in, uh, in an extension of this that we used to uh, enforce transitive immutability, and we found the error messages were, were quite challenging. Um, and they were really complicated, I think, by support for polymorphism and some of the other features. So those features are good, uh, but they make usability uh, challenging. Um, furthermore, a lot of these systems lack some key properties, right? One very natural property is transitive immutability, the idea that an entire data structure is immutable. Um, we find that uh, some of the work in the literature uh, provides only uh, a piece of this, right? Uh, Read-only references, perhaps, or uh, immutability for one object, but not for a whole transitive uh, group of objects. 
a data structure, right? And it's sometimes at times these things are hard to provide in practice, right? Uh, lack of support for things like arrays that uh, are very, uh, very key, you know, piece of data structures, or going beyond immutability to purity, which which might be useful, but uh, also comes with a lot of compromises, right? You can't touch any mutable data. Um, uh, even if it in, in operations, even if uh, your data structure itself is immutable. Um, so, you know, other systems uh, don't seem to have uh, quite the right uh, point, at least in the design space, as far as we were able to find uh, when we developed a system that, that was usable and useful. Um, you know, it, it's not obvious what combination of features is needed. Uh, I hope I'll convince you that we found one uh, that, that fulfills that, but uh, which other ones do, right? Um, and it's not obvious what is required for usability. So um, uh, to explore this, we looked at trying to get some design ins for the sites based on interviews with experts. Uh, so the first question we asked is, you know, are bugs caused by state change, right? Um, and uh, the answer we got from uh, one of our expert interviews was, oh God, like most of them, right? <laughs> um, so maybe this is preaching to the crier if, uh, if uh, you know, some of you are fans of functional programming, but there definitely was agreement among the experts we interviewed that incorrect state change was a major cause of bugs. And uh, so this uh, really, uh, I think, established the importance of immutability as a property. Um, you know, we also talk with people about, you know, are there are existing mechanisms that they might be familiar with in popular languages like const or final sufficient, uh, especially when, for example, dealing with concurrency. And our experts told us, no, this is too weak, right? Uh, both lack transitivity, which is critical, right? If you pass a data structure from one thread to another and you want immutability to avoid uh, conflicts between those threads, uh, then you want the whole data structure to be, um, uh, to be immutable. Uh, furthermore, const, uh, you know, uh, dis disallows mutation through one reference, uh, but not necessarily through others, right? And so uh, um, talking with them about these problems focused our attention on transitive immutability. And, and this was actually a first insight that we got, which is that, uh, you know, focusing on the specific property that matters could help us make a simpler system versus trying to support, you know, a wide variety of properties uh, all within one framework. Uh, finally, what is the granularity of immutability? That's a question we asked. And, and what we found was experts told us uh, most of the classes, most of the data structures they're dealing with are designed either to be mutable or to be immutable, but not both, right? It's rare to mix mutable and immutable instances of classes. And so we focused our attention on class immutability. A, a class or you know, an abstract data type was either fully immutable or not. Um, and this was another insight, right? Understanding the features of the domain actually helped us to simplify the problem because it turns out that specifying that an entire data structure is always immutable or always mutable is actually much simpler than saying that part of it is mutable or immutable or saying that um, you know, some instances of the data structure are immutable and others are not. Now, let me talk a little bit about the design we came up with. Uh, so this is uh, Glacier's uh, an extension to Java um, with annotations. It's implemented in the uh, um, annotation uh, checker framework. Um, and uh, you've, you, it's as simple as putting an immutable annotation on classes. So you write immutable class person. That says that every instance of person is immutable. Uh, that's why, why we call it a class immutability system. Um, and then, of course, if you assign to fields, uh, then you'll get an error because all the fields are implicitly final. You don't have to actually declare them that way, but uh, they are. Um, the fields of the data structure are checked. Uh, so string is okay because that's immutable, uh, but perhaps we forgot to put an immutable annotation on address and then we get an error from that because again, we're checking transitive immutability. So it's a fairly simple uh, system, um, not too hard to understand. How did we get here? Well, um, user studies with our variant of immutable generic Java showed really the need to simplify uh, if we were going to make a system that was easy to teach uh, and easy to use. Um, transitive class immutability was uh, what we heard from our experts was uh, the thing that they really needed and the thing that they lacked in current systems. And it provided a focus, right? So that we could get that simplicity by just focusing on this property uh, and not worrying about other kinds of features. Uh, 
Uh, so then, of course, we iteratively prototyped. Uh, our first design wasn't perfect, but we we tried different designs with users and and we tested this design with them. And and when we found they were confused, we uh, went back to the drawing board and fixed things. And and after multiple rounds, we ended up with something that was fairly usable. Uh, and so I hope to convince you that it actually was. Uh, we did a randomized control trial with uh, 10 participants in Glacier and 10 in Java, and we asked, can Glacier participants enforce immutability better than with final? Okay, so uh, we're comparing against the state of the practice. Um, we aren't uh, comparing against other immutability systems, uh, but none of them have been compared, really evaluated for usability the way we're doing. So uh, we wanted to get one result uh, that, that something is usable first. Uh, so we took each participant and they, we had them carry out two tasks and the measure was could they correctly complete them um, in java no one got it right and this is actually even though we gave them some expert advice from uh, uh, josh block's effective java um, uh, it's just too hard to follow the rules right the rules are uh, simple but there's a lot of them and um, you just you know fall down somewhere usually uh, and so uh, Glacier, though, uh, 19 out of 20 people were able to successfully complete the task, and that's a statistically significant result. Our second question was, are Java programmers more likely to insert bugs than Glacier users? Uh, for this, we had each participant carry out two tasks. One was based on the uh, famous um, Java get signers bug from an early version of Java. And we measured uh, how many people uh, completed the task correctly and how many completed it at all. At all. So uh, in Glacier, uh, we had 14 correct solutions, um, and uh, that was all the people who completed. Uh, so six people didn't actually complete uh, these tasks. Um, but in Java, 18, 18 people completed them, but only seven of those were correct. Okay, so we had uh, double the uh, correct uh, tasks in Glacier versus Java, and that's another statistically significant result, at least in the second task we performed. Um, and uh, you might ask, you know, why? Uh, we did slow some people down in Glacier. Um, and why didn't they complete? Well, um, you know, basically uh, immutability in these tasks was hard. These tasks involved arrays. Um, and uh, with arrays, uh, you can't enforce that an array is immutable. Uh, so you have to copy it into a, um, when, if you pass it into a data structure, you have to make a copy. And so that was a subtlety that was easy to miss. Um, and uh, the Java people just kind of breeze right through and, and try to complete it, but in many cases uh, did something wrong. Uh, whereas in the Glacier case, uh, this type system told them that something was wrong. Um, so uh, then they had to actually grapple with this difficult problem. Uh, what I think is great is that most of them solved it, right? Uh, we did uh, um, slow down a couple of them uh, so they didn't complete it in the task uh, time that we gave them, but most people completed it and many more people completed it than in Java. So to us, this was a success. Uh, so some takeaways, you know, getting usability right is hard. Anyone I think could have designed a system with the right features for usability, but no pre prior research did, or at least demonstrated uh, that they did. Um, and so I think that, you know, the failure modes are not picking the properties that are important in practice, adding too much complexity, um, you know, which might be good things for a research exploration, uh, but for a usable system, uh, they weren't able to quite get there. Um, a caveat, of course, we didn't test all the competing systems for usability. There may be other combinations of features that are usable and useful besides the ones that we found. And so I think further research in usability, in immutability and other uh, items is a, is a great way to go. Uh, the second takeaway is that this really required some key insights that came from HCI techniques, right? Uh, the idea that uh, from the domain uh, that we can use class immutability uh, to simplify things, so the fact that we should really focus on transitive immutability, um, uh, those came from inter expert interviews, and the final design came from iterative prototyping with users, and this was all very important to getting things right. So how do we generalize this technique? Uh, so Michael came up with this uh, approach that ca it captures what, uh, what we did in our research. Um, it's called pliers, programming language, iterative evaluation and refinement system. How do we apply this, uh, this pliers methodology to, uh, to Obsidian? Um, so we started out with interviews and surveys really to do need finding, right? To understand the need for immutability and, uh, and figure out you know, how, how could we fulfill that need? 
Then there's design conception, and that involved, uh, you know, some playing with formal systems. We had a core calculus for Glacier. Uh, we did some natural programming, uh, which is really a kind of low fidelity prototyping where we ask users, you know, how would you like to write, uh, you know, a declaration that a data structure is immutable? Um, and we take their ideas and we get that to understand, you know, what a usable solution might look like. Um, the, the ideas from the users might not be actually, you know, directly usable, but they would give us some ideas that we can make into a usable system. We then did risk analysis, right? What could go wrong? Uh, cognitive dimensions of notations is an HCI technique that allows us to look at a language uh, notation basically and, and see what possible flaws there might be. Um, and so we can try to head off some of those flaws right from the get go, or we can evaluate them uh, in, uh, in studies with users. So uh, we did some formative uh, usability studies. Uh, we prototyped the compiler. Um, we looked at uh, you know, the core calculus and, and trying to uh, finish the formalization and, and start proving some key properties. Um, and then uh, we finished with an assessment uh, of, you know, how well did we do in the end? And, and at this point, you know, in general, you might do a uh, full proof of correctness. Uh, you might do, um, we did a, a randomized controlled trial. You, we did some case studies to show, uh, you know, that this can actually be applied to real code. So that's a nutshell, the, the technique that we found. Of course, if it just applies to one example, it doesn't show you that uh, you have been successful, right? So a contrasting example we looked at is smart contracts in Obsidian. Um, uh, smart contracts uh, automate transactions, transactions between untrusted parties. Um, they are uh, tamper resistant, um, but they're often buggy, right? So there's the uh, a, a bug in the distributed autonomous organization of DAO that resulted in $50 million being stolen. Um, there's lots of other examples uh, in the literature of losing access assets, for example. Um, so we took Obsidian uh, and designed this as a sm safer smart contract language. Um, we used type state to mitigate misuse bugs, such as in the DAO, uh, and we used linearity to mitigate lost asset bugs. Uh, so the research goals were safety, um, coming from type state and linearity, but also usability. Um, and so we used pliers uh, here again to try to get that. Uh, here's a little glim glimpse at what Obsidian looks like. Uh, we have a, a contract tiny vending machine uh, that has uh, some coins in the coin bin. Uh, it has two states. Uh, so we have the full state in which there's some candy in the inventory and the empty state. Um, we can have a transaction such as buy. Uh, and the signature of the transaction tells us what happens. The tiny vending machine will go from full to empty um, and we'll pass in a coin and that coin will initially be owned by the client, uh, but it will be taken up by the tiny vending machine. And after, so afterwards, it will no longer be, be owned by the client. Uh, however, we will return some candy, which then the client will own. So uh, that's the signature. What do we do? Well, we take the coin bin, we deposit the coin, um, we get the uh, candy out of the inventory. Uh, we transition to empty. This is a very tiny vending machine. There's only one candy, uh, piece of candy in it. Uh, and we return the candy to the user. Um, so you see a little state machine about you know, where we can buy and refill uh, this candy machine. So, um, you know, uh, what did we learn about usability when designing the system? Well, uh, the first design change uh, looked at uh, state and ownership in our type annotations. Uh, so our tiny, tiny vending machine can be full or empty, um, but uh, we also own it. And uh, it's important that we own it because only things that we own can we track and change the state of, right? So there's an ownership system, much like Rust. It's a little simpler because we're not doing full memory management. Um, but uh, we needed to capture both state and ownership to reason about uh, this tiny vending machine correctly. And separating them seemed conceptually clean. Uh, to our knowledge, all prior systems that supported both of these concepts actually separate them. Um, but when we uh, tried this with users, we found that there was a complexity disadvantage here. One user told us, I haven't seen types that complex in an actual language and forced a compile time before. Um, so it, it turns out that separation is actually not needed in our type system. Uh, for example, uh, these aren't actually fully orthogonal. Uh, the only way you can keep track of an object state is if it's owned. And so type state actually implies ownership. And so we actually uh, took off the owned annotation and we just talked about whether a tiny machine, tiny vending machine is full or empty. Um, and this turned out to be much easier to teach uh, participants. 
So uh, the insight here is that actually refactoring technical ideas uh, can give the user a simpler conceptual model um, that is, uh, makes the system more usable. A second design change made ex permission changes more explicit. Uh, so the original annotation that we wanted to use for passing money to a function is just to pass owned money, right? And, and the idea is that the, fun, the, the, uh, the function gets the money. And if we wanted to return the money afterwards to the caller, we would use a, a borrowing construct, right? That's another idea from the literature. And, uh, but we got some feedback from users. This is confusing, right? When I annotate this as owned, I'm not sure if I'm making a variable owned or if I'm transferring ownership, right? And so we, we realized we actually needed to make explicit the change in ownership in the type system. So our, our revised design for passing money to the function says uh, we'll take a coin um, and it will be uh, go from owned to unowned. And so when the ownership changes, you see that in the types. And then for money that uh, we're going to pass in and return, we just use coin add owned. Um, so, that, so the change in permission is explicit in the notation. Uh, prior work was split between these two options. Uh, but now after our work, we know which of these is more usable. Uh, so the insight here is really making the notation match the user's conceptual model um, will help make the system more usable. So uh, did it work out, right? Is Obsidian's type system actually more usable? Well, we did a usability study with six participants. Um, we gave them 90 minutes of training. Uh, so they had never seen Obsidian before. Um, and fo we followed it by three tasks, uh, modeling auctions, prescriptions, and a casino. Um, all of them completed the auctions task. Uh, the completion of the other tasks depended on how much time was available because uh, we had just a short uh, study period. Uh, but what was, what was neat was that Java experience in 90 minutes of training is enough for them to write at least one small Obsidian program. And uh, generally, it seemed like they were succeeding in, in all three tasks uh, if they had enough time. Um, so some people did it more quickly than others, typically the ones with more Java experience, as it turned out. Uh, we also did a randomized control trial here uh, using the auction task, the first of those. And uh, our 20 participants were, again, split between Solidity and Obsidian. Um, only two of the 10 Solidity participants completed the task correctly. Uh, so uh, nine out of the 10 finished, but uh, some of them had a bug that lost money. Okay. Whereas uh, seven out of the 10 Obsidian participants completed the task uh, and only one was buggy. Um, so it wasn't a bug that our type system could, uh, could find. Uh, they didn't lose any money. They just refunded it to the wrong person, right? So uh, unless you have a, a proof system that will completely prove something correct, you can still have some bugs. Uh, but many more uh, of our participants completed it correctly. Um, so that was, uh, I think, showed some success in, in our endeavors here. So uh, coming back to the big theme, um, designing usable type systems and programming languages is challenging. Um, you know, uh, trying to understand, uh, trying to find, to uh, come up with interesting properties and, and uh, come up with a highly expressive system might conflict with usability. Uh, and so historically, we've made some poor design decisions if we don't study usability. Uh, fortunately, HCI techniques can augment our typical toolbox to help us provide usability, as well as all the other things we want in languages, right? So we use interviews with experts, we use surveys, we use natural programming to get ideas about how to design a language in a natural way. Uh, we did usability evaluation of prototypes. Uh, all those things helped. Um, of course, PL theory is still important, right? Pliers is a way of integrating uh, usability into ta uh, design tasks that you already do. And so it does include things like, you know, proving technical properties. And those are important because that's what actually, you know, provides the guarantees that make a new type system in this case useful. Um, finally, I hope I've convinced you that we got some deep technical insights that really uh, link these technical abstractions to human concepts and thinking patterns. Um, so understanding the key properties and the features of the domain, uh, things like uh, coming up with transitive immutability or understanding that class immutability is enough, understanding that states and assets are the right thing to, to focus on in Obsidian. Uh, these all influenced you know, what we chose to formalize and, and put in our type system. Uh, refactoring technical ideas to give the user a simpler but still sufficient mental model, right? We don't want to oversimplify because users have to uh, have a sufficient mental model to deal with the challenges. Uh, but we found that, uh, you know, transitive immutability was a simple concept that could be notated in a single annotation 
rather than building it out of kind of more primitive parts. And that was useful. Uh, similarly, combining type state and permissions uh, really preserved most of the expressiveness uh, in our system, um, but uh, enabled us to uh, provide the user with a simpler mental model. And of course, these are also things that affected how we formalized the system, right? It really influenced the core technical concepts in our design. Finally, making the notation match the conceptual model. Uh, so here, you know, you, instead of borrowing, uh, we uh, used um, a, a kind of pre and post condition notation to show what the type state was before and after. And that was effective as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, did it work? Well, in the end, randomized controlled trials in two settings illustrate that I think big wins for usability are possible. Uh, so um, uh, try it out. Uh, see if you can integrate some usability into your work. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks.